Hey, thanks so much for checking out today's message at Propel Church. We believe that God is moving powerfully in our church and we would love to connect with you. So be sure to hit the like button, comment, subscribe, even share. If you want to get connected, you can visit our website, propel.church. But for now, let's lean in, take notes and enjoy God's word. We've been in this message series called Sleeping with Serpents, and it has been an amazing one. And so today, you're going to have the opportunity to hear a, a, what we call a team teaching weekend. You're going to hear from multiple communicators this morning. I've got some incredible people on the stage with me, and, uh, and they're going to do amazing. But I want to make sure you know why we do team teaching weekends. Here at Propel Church, we are passionate about raising up and training people to preach and teach God's word. We believe that if we have one communicator who can do it, we can impact a few hundred. But when we raise up and train people who can preach God's word all across the world, we can not just reach hundreds, we can reach thousands, even millions of people with the good news of Jesus. And so this morning, you're going to hear from some communicators as they teach. You need to amen louder than you've ever amened. They might tell a joke that you don't think is funny, I'm telling you, laugh anyways, right? Like we want to encourage these people as they cultivate the gift that God has put on their life. And as we do that today, we're all going to run through a theme verse from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. It says this, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, Be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. That's our goal today, church, is to get rid of some stuff. Will you do me a favor? Will you put your hands together and help me welcome our first communicator this morning, Jessica Flanders. Well, good morning. Um, Again, my name is Jessica Flanders, and my family and I have been coming to Propel for about two years now. Um, My husband and I both have the privilege to serve here at Propel. Um, I serve in the children's area, and you probably saw my husband in one of the orange shirts out in the parking lot. Um, I just found out the other day, apparently he does some karate kicks when he's guiding people in, so if that was who you saw, that was my husband. Um, So I'm just really honored to be here today to talk to you guys. Uh, My uh, part here is to discuss um, bitterness. And I'm sure like many of us, we think of the word bitterness and there's a lot that comes to mind that we've either experienced or maybe even currently experiencing. And so when I was first asked, I kind of had this whole story I was going to share about my uncle and how he mishandled funds from my dad's um, insurance payout when he passed away. Um, But God really pressed on my heart to share something a little different with you today. So for many of you who know me, I've been very open about my journey to have open heart surgery to fix a congenital heart disease that I have. And um, this kind of started for us in my family with my dad being diagnosed when he was about 32 years old. And I was probably about 9 or 10, so I was really young. I didn't really understand what it meant, um, other than he was no longer in the military, and he had to have surgeries, and, you know, even the medical field didn't know as much as they do today. And so my sisters and I, it wasn't a concern for us um, until my older sister passed away at the age of 23. And so for our family, that was kind of a pivotal moment for my younger sister and I to go get tested. Thankfully, my younger sister did not have it, but I did. Um, And so I was 19 years old when this took place, very young, probably finishing up my first year of college, had these really big dreams. I was going to go work for the FBI one day, and um, this changed everything for me. And so I kind of was clueless about it. I was scared, which kind of slow, like slowly started to turn into bitterness for me. Um, you know, and of course, at that time, I didn't know, but God had way bigger plans for me. Um, of course, you know, as I started to see my future, what felt like it was unraveling, that bitterness really started to kick in for me. And my relationship with God at that time was just one of convenience. Um, didn't really understand what Jesus had done for me. And I would just pray, and you know, because it seemed like the thing to do. You see it on TV, and you're like, oh, I'm just going to pray to God. I don't really know, but I'm angry, and I'm questioning him, and I'm saying things like, why me, and why now, and just why? Why was this happening? And I continued on with my life, navigating kind of the normal ups and downs. Um, I got married. 
and I, you know, had a, um, I got married and, to my wonderful husband, and things really started to seem like they were turning up. We tried for seven years to have a baby, and then I got pregnant with my son. Um, and so, you know, my life at that point, I really kind of managed through the big changes, and my career was taking off, and I felt like everything was really in place. And we were preparing for this baby we wanted so badly. And about a month before I was supposed to deliver, I was given news that I had pulmonary hypertension um, from my heart. And, um, and actually, a lot of the doctors had told me throughout my pregnancy, I didn't have anything to worry about. Most people with my heart condition actually do really well. Um, that was not the case for me, unfortunately. And so uh, I was told I had a 50% chance of survival during childbirth because of the high blood pressure. Um, so our conversations with my husband turned from excitement to, you know, just what are we going to do? Um, what do I want you to tell my son if I don't make it? Um, things that I just didn't have planned. And so that bitterness kind of snuck back in for me. And I, again, didn't really have this strong relationship with God. Um, so I was just questioning and angry. And I would question, you know, why me? Why this? Why now? Just Why? Um, but the thing I want to share with you today is that life's challenges bring you closer to the greatness God has for you. And it may not seem like God has your back or he is even there when you're in the middle of whatever storm you're facing, but he is. And as you can see, I did survive childbirth. I had a plan C-section, and as you know it, he decided he wanted to come early. So it was like a Friday evening, and I went into labor, and uh, God placed all the right people in that room that night. Um, but there was also something really amazing happening that I wasn't aware of until later. And so a friend of mine who is a great child of God um, told me later that her grandson, who was living with her at the time, he was about four years old, he came in at midnight, which is about the same time that I was delivering my son. And she said, Nana, Nana, I, we need to pray for Miss Jessica right now. And of course, she didn't question it. They stopped. They got on their knees. They started praying. And I know now that God wanted me to know that because he wanted me to know that he was there even when I wasn't relying on him at that moment. And so there's just so much good that, come, that has come from what I've experienced. And even when I don't, didn't know who God was, he still forgave me. He loves me so much that he was there for me when I was bitter towards him. And no matter the difficulty of a situation or how right you may feel in your bitterness towards a situation, a person, or even God, he still loves you. He doesn't cause the bad things to happen in your life. What the enemy intended for evil, God can make good. And most importantly, he loves us so much that he sent his only son, Jesus, to forgive us. So I encourage all of you to look at your story. Remember, no matter the hurt you feel, the bitterness you may have, that God loves us. He's already forgiven you. And he wants you to find freedom by forgiving those who may have caused bitterness in your life. And so I'm reminded of Colossians 3.13. And I'd like to end with sharing my favorite translation of this verse from the message translation, which says, So chosen by God for this new life of love, dress in the wardrobe God picked out for you. Compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength, discipline. Be even-tempered, content with second place, quick to forgive an offense. Forgive as quickly and completely as the master forgave you. And regardless of what else you put on, wear love. It's your basic, all-purpose garment. Never be without it. Thank you. How's everybody doing this morning? Yeah. My name is Jimmy. I have the privilege of serving here on the worship and production team. Um, I'm married to a very lucky woman named Courtney, okay. and we have two kids named Aiden and Aubrey. And before I get started this morning, I just want to take a second to thank Pastor Nick and Tori for this opportunity to stand here and bring you this word. So today, I'm going to talk to you about anger. Real quick, does anybody in here struggle with anger? All right. Uh, it's more than I was expecting I had. I was planning on changing the message to lying, but y'all did good. <laughs> So me naturally, I don't, I, don't, I don't naturally get angry, you know, very easily. It usually takes a lot to make me mad. But one thing that parenthood has taught me 
is that sometimes I have a blind spot for my kids making me mad. So I'm going to tell you a short story real quick about one time my four-year-old son had me seriously considering selling him on eBay. (laughs) Y'all think I'm kidding. (laughs) So one night about a year ago, um, I picked him up from my wife, Courtney, and as soon as he got in my truck, he was screaming bloody murder because he wanted McDonald's. And I don't mean crying, I want McDonald's. He was top of his lungs, like gagging himself, he's screaming so hard. And I told him, I said, if you just stop, if you just calm down, I'll stop at McDonald's. I don't think I was being unreasonable, but he he really was. But he kept on, and he eventually cried himself to sleep. And whenever we got home, he woke up and realized we were at home without McDonald's. He was even more mad. And he picked up right where he left off. And uh, at this point, I started to get a little frustrated because he's screaming, and it's, it's been going on for 30 minutes. And I told him, I said, Aiden, if you say McDonald's one more time, you're going to be in trouble. He looked at me right in the face and said, I want McDonald's. <laughs> I can, got any parents in here? So y'all already know. I prob- y'all probably already know I lost my mind when that happened. So that wasn't exactly my proudest dad moment. But looking back now, I feel like I could have handled that a little better. I'm sure a lot of us have heard, be angry and sin not. When Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 4, like I've spent years trying to figure out what exactly that means. Like, how do you be angry and not sin? I've, heard, I've had people explain it to me um, as righteous anger. and They'd always reference Jesus flipping tables over and they were blocking the entrance of the temple. So I've spent pretty much my whole adult life just waiting to come to church and see a bunch of tables in front of the door so I could flip them over. <laughs> and, uh, but that hasn't happened, so... Whenever, uh, whenever I got the topic of anger, I saw that as an opportunity to, to dig into what exactly is being angry without sin. So Paul was actually quoting a psalm when he says this, and I didn't know that until I started reading and reading, studying for this. So let's see what he says. Let's see what David says in Psalm chapter 4, verses 2 through 4. He says, How long will you people ruin my reputation? How long will you make groundless accusations? How long will you continue your lies? You can be sure of this. The Lord set apart the godly for himself. The Lord will answer when I call to him. Don't sin by letting anger control you. Think about it overnight and remain silent. So what I take from this is that anger itself is not a sin, but the actions and words that we use when we're angry is what leads us to sin. So in verse 2, we can see what David is angry about. And I I dug into it a little bit, and this lines up with 2 Samuel chapter 15 where... um, David's son, Absalom, he wants to be king himself. And he's trying everything he can to make his dad, King David, seem unworthy for the, for, to be king. And he's got all the religious leaders on his side, and he started a rebellion against him. I'm sure if my son Aiden had any of his friends with him that night, the McDonald's incident happened, he, they would have started a rebellion against me. <laughs> so let's see how David tells us to respond in these situations. Verse 3 tells us that as Christians, we are set apart. That means that we are held to a different standard than the rest of the world. When our four-year-olds rebel against us, we have the option to respond in anger or we can take it to God. David also says in verse 3, the Lord will hear when I call on him. So when you get mad, have the confidence to know that God's going to hear whatever it is you you say to him whenever you get angry. He's big enough to handle your anger. So when my kid was screaming his, screaming my ears off, I didn't go to God in that situation. I might have thought, God, please make this stop. But I didn't, I didn't stop to think, you know, what are you trying to show me in this moment? So finally in verse four, we read, don't sin by letting anger control you. Think about it overnight and remain silent. So if you're taking notes, this is what I want you to write down. Anger is an opportunity. Anger is an opportunity. So it's easy to let anger control our words and actions. That's what leads us to sin. David is telling us to slow down and take our anger to our father. If I had slowed down and not responded out of anger to my rebelling son, I wouldn't have lost my cool. I had an opportunity in that moment to go to God. But I tried to tune out the screams of a four-year-old whose world was ending over a dang Happy Meal. So when we get angry, it's an opportunity to lean into God and ask Him what's the real reason this is bothering us. 
if we take David's example, we need to recognize what we're angry at and remember that as Christians, we don't have to respond immediately. And then we can take it to God and trust that he hears us. Thank you. Come on, can we give it up for Jimmy? So I wasn't originally in the team teaching weekend. I got, I got tagged in yesterday, and uh, I'm going to teach the person's notes that was unable to be here. But, man, I'm just so honored to share the stage with these other communicators this morning. And we've gone through Ephesians chapter 4. We've talked about Paul saying to get rid of bitterness, and then Jimmy touched on rage and anger. And I have the opportunity to touch today on harsh words. Have you ever heard the expression, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will, they'll never hurt you, right? And, and that, that's typically told to us as a kid where, where the goal is when you're getting bullied or you're getting picked on, you can just say, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. It's to lighten the blow that words actually have over our life. The problem is it's not a true expression at all. Because sticks and stones will, will probably break your bones and words will absolutely hurt you, right? Like, like words are incredibly powerful. There have been things that have been spoken over your life where people have said things to you and they have hurt you tremendously. Words have tremendous power. I want us to understand today that harsh words have the power to destroy like, like the words that you, maybe, maybe your deepest wounds have come from the harsh words that other people have spoken over you. Like some of you remember what was said to you on that playground when you were in kindergarten. Right? You remember those words that people said. You remember what it was like when that first grade teacher looked at you and said, you'll never amount to anything. Or you remember that relationship you had in high school when someone said to you that no one would ever love you, or, or that boss that looked at you and said, you're an idiot, and there's no way you're going to move up in this company. There, there's been harsh words that have been spoken over each one of us at some point in our life. Proverbs 12, 18 says this, the words of the reckless pierce like swords. So, so uh, two thoughts there. One is that harsh words actually cut deeply. They're like a sword. They, they have the power to cut you and I. They pierce us. But also those who use harsh words are reckless in their life. Then it says this, but the tongue of the wise bring healing. You and I have all experienced harsh words from time to time. We can recall back memories and moments. Some of you right now are even thinking about harsh things that have been spoken over you. But the good news for those of us who are followers of Jesus is that we don't have to stay there. Proverbs chapter 15 verse 1 says, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Gentle and wise words have the power to shift situations in our life. They have the ability to change environments. When you transition your life from speaking harsh words over others to speaking wise words over them, you move from being reactive to being responsive. You move from letting every situation and every circumstance dictate the words you have into the place where you speak God's best over people's lives. Just because hard Harsh words have the power to destroy doesn't mean that you have to use them. In fact, in Scripture, when we see God talk about the language that we would have over other people, the challenge is that we would use our words to build up because wise words have the power to transform. Yeah, harsh words have the power to destroy, but wise words have the power to transform. They have the power to shift moments in your life. They have the power to transform your marriage, your workplace environment, your interactions with friends and family, even that person that cuts you off in traffic. Come on, right? Like when you get stuck behind a tractor on 73, I know y'all, I know y'all need some wise words. Let me give you three practical things if you want to shift your words to be wise words. Number one is this, press pause. Everybody do me a favor, take a deep breath. <sighs> Sometimes you need to breathe before you speak, right? Life is going to happen. People are going to make you mad. Sometimes you just need to hit pause for a moment 
to gather some clarity and really get God's vantage point over a situation. Number two, express gratitude. But when you begin to express gratitude over the things that God has entrusted you with, the, the things that he's given you, you express gratitude for the people in your life. How you speak dictates the person you become. It shapes the world that you live in. And so as you express gratitude, it changes your viewpoint to speak God's best over people's life. And third thing is this, pray. Pray. If you want to change your language, if you want to change the way you use words in your life, what I've found is that prayer is so powerful because it gives me God's viewpoint of other people when I'm connected to him. I don't always see people the way God sees them. Sometimes he loves them, and I just want to throat punch them. Come on, you ever been there? But when you pray, you get God's perspective of them. And as you get God's perspective of them, it will change the way you speak to them. Thanks so much. Pastor Nick is truly incredible, and he, I love how he can just jump in on things like that and uh, make it just that, that wonderful. Um, and I really do want to acknowledge him this morning. When he says he wants to train up communicators and, and empower and pour into people, he really does mean that. So Pastor Nick, thank you for having a heart and Tori for, for doing that in, in our lives as well. And Jimmy, um, I get hangry a lot, so we aren't going to go eat somewhere because me and Aiden would be doing the exact same thing in the back seat if I really want a McDonald's. My poor wife has had to endure that and my children, who are awesome, and they are here. Uh, we, my wife, Christy, and I have been blessed to serve here at Propel for several years now. And uh, she's out there in the coffee table. We have two amazing kids. But this morning, um, I really want to talk about slander, which was something that if you would have asked me a month ago, I would say is not really a concern. I don't feel really strongly that I slander people until Tori came up and said, hey, I would really love for you to be a part of Team Teaching Weekend. You're going to teach on slander. And I said yes, and 37 times. I know that because I started keeping count. 37 times the first week that I was challenged to look into Scripture and to knew that this was coming up, I caught myself going to slander somebody. And you say, wow, you're, you're really talking bad about people a whole lot. Well, here's the truth. There's a biblical standard of slander and there's a legal standard. So the legal standard, we say, well, well, that just means I'm saying stuff about somebody that is untrue. Like I'm saying just crazy things about them, making allegations that are not true. But when we look closer, we have to understand what God's standard is. And God's standard with slander with a lot of things must be our standard. See, God says in 1 Peter 2, 1, therefore putting aside all, all, all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, and envy, and all slander. See, a lot of biblical commentaries will tell you, and if you really dive into Scripture, slander is going kind of back to what Pastor Nick talked about last week with gossip, but it's talking about somebody and saying something negative, even if it's true. I get it. People drive you crazy. People make your jobs harder. People do things that you will never understand. I looked at my wife last weekend and I said, I've got to stop wasting mental capacity trying to understand why people do what they do. I'm just called to, to work with it, right? And so when you come home and you're frustrated with that coworker or you're upset about somebody in your family and you're talking about them, and it's very much true, but you're talking about them in a negative way, you're slandering that person. And God's standard is that we must remove all slander. From that, See, I have to realize, just somebody said, well, how do I know? Well, the Holy Spirit will convict you, and what he's the Holy Spirit has convicted me of is that I have to be very aware about who I'm talking about. See, what happens is a lot of times we get going, we want to talk about people that God have made, people that God created. When we slander somebody, we're really attacking somebody that God 
has created. When I look at a piece of artwork and I talk about it and say, well, that looks ridiculous, that doesn't look nice, who did that? I'm talking about the creator. So when I talk about somebody negative and I'm saying, then I'm basically bringing into question, well, maybe God didn't make them as smart as I think he should. Maybe God didn't gift them in a way that I feel like he should. But see, guys, God's standard on this is something that we have to embrace because God cares very much about promoting our spiritual health. When you look at Matthew 5, there is a standard that God sets, that Jesus sets for us that is so clear about how we need to be interacting with people. He talks explicitly about what we should do when somebody is doing something around us to us. And he says, but that if, 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 if anyone, if you're angry with somebody, if you're talking about somebody, if you're slandering somebody here in Matthew 5, he says, therefore, if you're at the altar, if you're at the altar, you are to leave your offering and go reconcile with your brother and then come back. And present your offering because God cares about our spiritual health. And if we're really going to do that, if we're really going to be somebody that cares about our spiritual health and that speaks life into people, then we have to remove certain things. And slander is a key piece. I have very few trees in my yard. In fact, I only really have three. It's not a big, a lot to keep track of, which I like. But unfortunately, have you ever seen those tent worms or like the web worms that come and make the webs in the corner of the tree? One of them got one of my three trees. What are the odds? But so I noticed this about six, eight weeks ago. I see it kind of there and I'm like, ah, I'm just going to leave it alone. Well, I don't do anything for a couple weeks and it starts getting worse to the point that I realize that I have to do something. Matthew 5, Jesus goes on to say, if your right, hand, right eye makes you stumble, tear it out. Throw it away. It's better for you to lose that part than your whole body. If your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. I never understood that until I looked at this tree. And I realized, if I don't cut that branch off, these web worms are going to eat and consume the entire tree. It's going to kill it all. So I get my saw out and I saw off the branch and I remove that branch. And therefore I removed the problem and I have encouraged spiritual health. See guys, at the end of the day, Jesus doesn't just want to not talk about our enemies and people that drive us crazy. He wants us to actually pray for them in Matthew 5, 44, to love our enemies to pray for the people that drive you crazy. It's not just about not slandering. It's about going above and beyond. So here is the final challenge with that. If we are to remove that, you look at Psalm 15 and you see that Jesus says, if you, the psalmist says, if you, like Jesus, if you want to be somebody that stands in God's, oh Lord, in his favor, who may abide in your tent, who may dwell on your holy hill, he who walks with integrity, works righteousness, and speaks truth in his heart. He does not slander with his tongue. This is somebody that God says is somebody that he wants to abide with him. Hey, guys. It's so um, awesome to be up here with you guys this morning. Thank you, Pastor Nick and Tori, for asking me to come up here and to share a word that God has put on my heart. But also, I would love to honor our communicators. Can we give them a round of applause really quick just to honor them and their courage this morning? A um, little bit about me. My name is Alyssa Douglas, and I have the joy of serving um, with our Propel students, which is our 6th through 12th graders here at Propel. And I also serve on the Dream Team. If you don't know me, you may have seen me. I like to dance around in the lobbies in the morning. It's really fun. Um, but we are wrapping up our Sleeping with Serpents series today. And I just want to recap our theme verse really quickly. It's Ephesians 4:31. And it says, to get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. And what my focus is this morning is evil behavior. And before we dive in, I was curious to know what behavior definitively met. So I consulted trusty Google. 
and found that behavior is a noun. And for all of my adults who have been out of school for a while, a noun is a person, place, or thing. So behavior is a thing. And I found two verses. The first one is, behavior is the way in which one acts or conducts oneself, especially towards others. And the second verse I found is, um, definition that I found is that the behavior is the way in which an animal or person acts in response to a particular situation or stimulus. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not an animal, so, but I really loved the way um, these verses use the words conduct and response. And so my first point that I have for you this morning is that behavior is a choice. We have a choice to behave in certain ways. Um, when I was in high school, I didn't have the best of friends. And because I didn't have the best of friends and didn't know any better, I chose to make decisions that were not good for me. Um, I wanted to stay out late. I wanted to go to cookout because that's what you did after 9 o'clock when you couldn't drive after 9, you know, all the things. Um, and so I, that would create tension between uh, me and my mom because she just wanted me to be safe and she wanted me to make wise choices. And I was like, no, these are my friends and I want to hang out with them. And so behaving in that certain way and not choosing certain things um, cause a tension between our relationship, but we're better now. Um, and so I wanted to um, tell you guys some good news is that even when we choose evil behaviors or behaviors that aren't good for us and that create tension between people, um, Jesus still loves us. He still loves us to not he still loves us enough to not let us stay stuck in those behaviors, um, even when it hurts our pride or our relationships or our healing processes um, or choosing forgiveness. God's plans are still good for us. Um, and I love what 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says. It says that the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand when you are tempted he will show you a way out so that you can endure. There's three things that I want to point out in this verse that really stuck out to me, is that we are not alone in our temptations. We are not alone in the temptations that we feel to be angry towards people or to slander people or to choose things that we know that we sh shouldn't because we know that they're not good for us, even though they might be feel good in the moment. Um, we are not alone in those. We do life together, and there are people who can relate to you and can help you see a way out. Um, the second thing about this verse is that God is faithful. And I don't know about you, but I found this to be really encouraging to know that the God who created the universe has faith in me to um, give me another chance to choose the right thing. And I think that is so good. Um, and the third thing is really important. It's found in the last part of the verse. It says, when you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. And it's not if we are tempted, but when we are tempted. As Christians, we are not told that once we receive Jesus into our lives that um, all temptation will go away and the enemy will never come after you again. It said he will come after you harder. And so um, when you are tempted, God gives us a way out. He always provides you a way out. And sometimes when we choose evil behaviors, um, it's so the enemy can trap us in envy or pride, shame, fear, or not feeling like we're worth it. Um, and those things lead to other things that continue to draw us into this hole that um, puts us in a place of uncomfortability. Um, but I want you to know, and my second thing that I have for you today is that our mistakes don't define or disqualify us. They don't define who we are on the inside, and they don't define um, who we get to be and grow into. Um, they don't disqualify you from the things that God has for you. He has good plans for you. And if our mistakes don't define or disqualify us, then that means that we can make choices that elevate us towards who we desire to be. And as Christians, um, we desire to be like Jesus. And we have to have the courage to choose the behaviors that Jesus would choose over what we want to choose. Um, and I have it in my notes like this. And I said that I have to be brave enough to take off my shell of comfortability and step into the freedom that God has planned for me. And I love what Philippians 2.15 says. And it says that we shine like stars in a dark world when we follow the word of God. We get the opportunity to be bright lights in a place that feels like a burden and feels like we're trapped in darkness when we choose the word of God, when we choose his truth. And I want to go back to the point that we are not alone in our temptations. You don't have to walk through the process of learning what it looks like to shine like a light in a dark world alone. 
Um, he doesn't, God doesn't want you to walk alone. Um, he wants you to plug in. He wants you to find people um, who will love you and help pull you out of um, anxiety and fear of not feeling like you're good enough, who will tell you truth over the lies that the enemy tries to get you to believe. Um, and we have to let people who God planted in our life help us, though. On our main verse this morning is Ephesians 431, but God doesn't tell us not to do something without telling us his why. Ephesians 432 says, instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. God chose you. He chose you to be a part of his good plans because he loves you. And I want to encourage you, if you're stuck in some things that you've chosen that you feel like you can't get out of, um, you have a choice to say no to it and move into what God has planned for you. We are called to be a people that chooses kindness, that chooses compassion, that chooses forgiveness. And forgiveness is hard, I'm not going to lie. Um, it can be hard to forgive yourself or others, and maybe you're here this morning and you're struggling to choose forgiveness or compassion or kindness towards yourself or towards someone who hurt you or that you're angry with, whatever the reason. Perhaps it's because God is asking you to receive his forgiveness first. He's asking you to let him love you and take care of you and to handle all the things that you feel like are weighing you down. Um, and we do this because God loves us so much that he would send his son to die on a cross for us to be the justification for all the sins that we've ever committed. Um, because of Jesus' sacrifice, we are washed clean. Um, and we do this by uh, making a choice to say that God, to tell God that we are here and we understand and we are ready to receive the free gift of salvation. And so I want to enter into a moment of prayer this morning um, where you can have the opportunity to make that choice. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, um, I would love for us all to pray this prayer together because we all pray together. Nobody prays alone. Um, if you want to make that decision to choose Jesus this morning, um, if you'll just slip your hand up really quickly. We're all going to pray together. Dear Jesus, today I give you my life. I place my hope and trust in you. Thank you for dying in my place so that I can have new life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us at Propel Church today. My name is Pastor Nick Newman, and on behalf of myself and our whole team here, we are so grateful that you chose to engage with our worship experience today and hear God's word. We would love to help you take a next step. But the only way we can do that is if you engage with us. So do us a favor, go to propel.church. If you feel led to uh, take a next step today, our website will walk you through that. And if you feel led to give, you can click the giving tab to partner with us financially to continue to impact Mount Pleasant and the surrounding areas for Jesus.